The virtual CISO moment is brought to you by VCISO Services, a leading provider of quality and experienced virtual chief information security officers for small and mid-sized businesses. Check them out at vcisoservices.com. Hi, I'm Greg Schaefer, and welcome to the Virtual CISO Moment. Don Colliver joins us today. He writes and delivers technical presentations at technology conferences, including CES, RSA, Black Hat, and Dreamforce for companies including Adobe, Cisco, DisplayLink, and Veronis. He teaches technical public speaking internationally at Google and around the world. He will be speaking at the 2023 Toastmasters International Convention in the Bahamas. Don, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks so much, Greg. It's great to be here. So I love to hear some of your background and just looking at your bio, uh, fascinating things. I definitely want to touch a little bit on Toastmasters having gone. Uh, I love Toastmasters. I think it's just a wonderful addition to a security professional's toolkit, but also some of the more interesting things about being a clown and being a blue man. So, so please tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, yes. Uh, okay. Let's see. How do I make this quick? Um, started in Detroit. That's where I'm from producing training videos and, uh, helping script training videos for automotive. Um, I ended up in TV in Los Angeles producing TV, but took a hard right in midlife and started doing comedy and improv and ended up, uh, pretty good at, physical comedy and interacting with audiences. That's where I ended up in the clown world. I was a uh, uh, the main clown for a show called Spiegel World. Uh, they have a show called Absinthe at Caesar's Palace. Some of your uh, listeners may be familiar with that. It's uh, the most popular show in Vegas often. It's a little bit racy, uh, but I did a North American tour for that company as the host clown. Um, but also at the same time, I was presenting at technical conferences and primarily cybersecurity conferences, uh, RSA, Black Hat, that sort of thing, uh, presenting marketing um, presentations, writing marketing presentations uh, for folks like you. That's awesome. I, I, I think that that's a great hit. How'd you get involved in Toastmasters? Well, I was presenting at those trade shows, uh, tech conferences, but... Uh, they're only once every two or three months. And so I was kind of like, man, I need to keep this muscle, keep warmed up and presenting. And uh, I'm a huge fan of Toastmasters. And uh, dependent upon your club, there's probably every listener that you have probably has five to 10 clubs within a 10 minute drive. They're everywhere. Uh, but Dependent upon the size of the club, one of the trademarks of Toastmasters is they try to give everybody an opportunity to get up in front of the group and speak every single meeting. And that's so important just to get up and have a low stakes reason to speak in front of five to 15 people, because some people are so petrified just to stand up. Once you do it a few times, it becomes a lot easier. And then in effect, it becomes easier to communicate your technical information. And one of my favorite parts of Toastmasters was the, um, I think they called it tabletop, if I remember correctly. Table topics. Yeah, table topics. That's right. Where you uh, get two to three minutes to talk. You're, you're given a topic right at the beginning. And you have two to three minutes, if I'm not mistaken, to just talk off the top of your head. Sort of like preparing you for elevator speeches if you have to make a very quick pitch. Um, and I just said, um, <laughs> I, I'm the worst. I'm the worst at filler words. So please don't feel bad around me. I'm, I'm not, I'm not counting either of us. I <laughs> tend to say so a lot. I, I love doing that though, but you're right too, from the aspect of actually getting up the first time that I stood up in Toastmasters and gave a, a prepared speech as part of the beginning of the comp what they call the competent compute. What do they call it now? They don't call it CC anymore. Do they? Now it's, now it's all part of the pathways program. It's all online learning. It used to be the competent communicators manual. This is like deep inside baseball Toastmasters folks, but, uh, now it's, it's, you choose all these different pathways, uh, um, and there's different modules. It's all online learning now. 
So for those who are confused that are in Toastmasters right now, when I say CC, it's because I'm old and I did this a while ago. <laughs> but, but the basics of it is the same. You get more comfortable, as you said, to stand up in front of, uh, in front of audiences, in front of groups. And that's something that us folks in the technical field do have a somewhat of a problem with because we're great at what we do from a technical standpoint, but being able to communicate it, whether it be in front of folks or to, um, there's the M, uh, it's in my head now, but to communicate. I, I, I'm folks, the same way. I went, I spoke in front of this, uh, group one time and they had a bell that they would ding every time they heard a filler <laughs> word. And I almost ran out screaming of the meeting. <laughs> but folks that are trying to speak not only in front of an audience, but even to communicate technical concepts to non-technical people, which is huge what we have to do in our field. What is um, just in preparation for a technical presentation? And part of the reason why I'm asking this is that I'm giving a somewhat technical presentation in about a week and a half. I haven't been in front of folks for probably eight months now, so I'm a little rusty. But what are three questions that you should ask yourself when you're creating a technical presentation in order so that you don't completely bore the pants off of folks in the audience? Well, the fact that you said audience is really the, the bottom line of all my training that I do for technical folks, because we're so used to focusing on the problem, right? We're great at that, like working on fixing things, but it's easy to forget about how to describe that problem to a non-technical audience. Uh, there's a book called Made to Stick. Uh, I love this book. Uh, you're, a lot of your audience has probably heard of it. It's by Chip and Dan Heath. But they, they term it as something called the curse of knowledge. Once we know this stuff, it's hard to remember how it was to not know it. So uh, it's important to come into your presentations and really put yourself in the shoes of your audience. Start where your audience is. So the three questions you want to ask are, OK, who's going to be there? Who's in the room? By that, I mean, what's their level of knowledge? Do you have to define terms? That sort of thing. What do they care about? What are their problems? OK, so first, who will be in the room? Second, what do you want them to do? What do you want them to walk out of your presentation and want to do or know? Uh, and if you can hold that five to seven word phrase of what you want them to do, you can use that as a yardstick for every part of your presentation. And if it's not contributing to what you want them to do, then you don't need to even say it. And lastly, what's in it for them? Why do they care? What, what problem of theirs is it solving? Uh, how is it going to make their life better? This sounds kind of like marketing speak, but if you're presenting in a uh, uh, technical uh, uh, context, uh, it's still you still want to make your audience's lives better somehow. And, it, and you need to think that way rather than in your brain, like, of course we need to do this. Everybody knows you need to kind of back off from that attitude. Well, I think you're, you, you are actually selling something as well, too. You're selling knowledge, you're selling experience, you're selling an engagement. And one of the more demoralizing, as much as you can get prepared for a presentation, when I'm out and I'm at the lectern or I'm on the stage and I'm doing the good Toastmasters and not like just pacing, but intentionally when I change direction, changing it, I believe at a change in topic, that sort of thing. So I'm trying to do all the right things, but I get distracted because I start seeing people take these things and start doing this while I'm talking, they're doing this. And I'm thinking to myself, I'm losing them. I'm losing them. I'm losing them. I mean, I mean, I mean, what do I do? Do I suddenly just shout or something or do I like clap or, or maybe, maybe I do something unexpected and fall off the stage or something like that to get them to engage again. But seriously, that, that is something that I almost find like a spiral that as soon as I start to see someone engage and it may not be an issue, it just may be they're listening, but they just got a text as an audience member. I try not to do that either, but I do that as well. But what are, how can we keep the audience engaged while we're trying to sell them, if you will, on our experience and our knowledge? Great question. And it's something I deal with every single trade show. If you've been 
to RSA Black Hat, any of those, you know that if someone's sitting in a booth, in a booth theater, pretty much every single person, maybe there's one person that's not on their phone that's listening to the presenter. So I kind of have to deal with that often. But uh, when you're not at a trade show, it's sometimes different. You know, they'll they'll be at least paying you the courtesy of looking at you as you're speaking. But the way to keep your audience engaged and also maybe more importantly, to gauge the rapport level uh, as you're moving through your presentation, are, like, are these people even understanding me? Are they all together? Uh, the way to do it is acknowledging your audience. Uh, there was a study done in 2010 and they it was in actually in a bio biology lecture in a big university in one of those big uh, 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 kind of stadium like uh, halls and all the students had dials of how engaged they were so the professor tried different tactics of engagement and they would indicate how engaged they were the, uh, they found that the professor found that of all the different tactics like asking direct questions was the one of the most effective ways to engage an audience, but also taking that one step forward, uh, acknowledging something about someone in the audience. Like, Greg, it looks like you're following me. I'm seeing your head nod a lot. Uh, doing that would immediately engage the entire audience, simply acknowledging something, kind of breaking that fourth wall. That's a theater term, mm -hmm. but um, it's kind of... A, reminding everybody that hey we're all here together this is a dialogue this isn't just me like throwing information at you you're also giving me nonverbal information and by that i don't mean in a punitive way i don't mean like greg listen up you're you're get off your phone i mean uh oh, i see some people understand what i'm talking about um so that's kind of the baseline of how to judge that rapport but i want to give your listeners four quick tips first like I say, acknowledge something that the audience is doing. That's one way to get them re-engaged. Secondly, you can make it present. And that means you can have them check something on their phones. You can have them look if there's handouts. Go to page four. Look at this. Anything that gets them moving in their immediate environment will kind of remind them, oh, my God, yes, I'm not watching Netflix. I'm actually here or I'm virtually here. Uh, listening to this person. You can tell a personal story and sometimes that feels really weird and sometimes it's inappropriate in maybe a cybersecurity context, but you can tell about when you learn something or something about some technology that really impresses you. That's mm -hmm. a way of telling a personal story that will feel to the audience like, oh, Greg is stepping out of his standard outline and he's saying this just for us. That will be engaging. And lastly, you can just ask your audience to do something. That, that's the classic, you know, doing a poll in Zoom or a hand raise engagement or anybody ever do this, raise your hand. Uh, that's kind of the classic way to engage. Well, what if uh, the audience, which this tends to happen in technology, I don't want to paint a broad brush, so to speak, but um sometimes uh there's more of a of a presence of introverts and they they get to feel a little uncomfortable or don't want to raise my hand for example or don't want a question is that going to put them off in any way or does that positively uh, engage or do do they not really respond at all to something like that well i think it really depends on how you set up your presentation i once heard a phrase called make deposits before you make withdrawals. And by that, I mean, uh, if you can show vulnerability, and that's a weird word to say in like corporate uh, uh, presentations, but if you can acknowledge something at the top of like, I didn't know this thing and I had to learn it, uh, that may give an example to your audience like, oh, this is an okay place to maybe be imperfect. Because I know when I'm working with coders and engineers at Google, uh, they have their day to day is they need to be perfect. But when it comes to presentations, I think the medium is OK to be imperfect. In fact, being an imperfect speaker, I think, deepens the communication because the audience will relate to you. The thing you do need to be confident in and that you do need to be pretty perfect in is your content in is your expertise. 
I always say I can joke about me, the speaker. I never joke about my content or expertise. We're talking about content made me think about and, and often use saying death by PowerPoint. I've been at some presentations where it's very engaging and uh, very interesting what is on the screen. I've been some presentations where the presenter is just basically reading from the PowerPoint, which to me, it, it disengages. Uh, and, and, and is there some recommendation there as to best practices to what you put up on the screen, how you, how you make that presentation? Wow. Well, there's, th that's a big question. Uh, there are <laughs> deep, deep courses and books about how to handle that stuff. But in terms of just to acknowledge what you just said about reading off your slides. Oh man, it's, it's challenging because I get it. Uh, the folks I deal with in my classes every week, they don't have time to do extensive rehearsals. Uh, sometimes they are using those slides as prompts and I can't take that away from them. That's the way life is like, they're very busy. They're dealing with a lot of things, but I will say if possible, if you can lead your slides, this next slide has a really interesting, uh, some really interesting data about X, then show it. And also a way to easily kind of back away from death by PowerPoint is after you show any kind of a data on a slide, turn back to your audience and give some kind of personal response to it. When I saw this data, I was really heartened because I'll tell you what, it's making us me feel like we're doing something that's solving problems click, go on to the next one. It's an easy way to kind of make it back engaging, taking it off just data barf all the time. Data barf. I kind of like that. <laughs> that's a term that's copywritten. No, just <laughs> I, I'm, I'm going to use that. Just tell me where to send the royalties. I try to use, from my personal experience, I'll use the presentation very lightly usually. If I'm not presenting actual data, like graphs or charts or what have you, each slide will be almost a prompt for me. It's like, okay, I'm like I'm giving a presentation in, in a week and a half on consulting and information security. So each one is like the basic topic I'm working about. I'm talk I'm going to talk about, and it it is more of a prompt for me to remember. Okay, now this is when I wanted to talk about, say, forming an LLC or something like that. I think that there's a and, and I could be wrong. And the reason why I'm asking this or I'm presenting this is that tell me if I'm way off base or not. But I think that there's sort of a happy medium between using too much PowerPoint and not using enough. Because on the flip side, I've been to conf I've been to presentations where a presenter has put a slide up on the screen and it's been the same slide there for for 30 minutes. And I'm like, why is it even there? It's I keep on it keeps drawing my mind to try to make that analytical collection connection for, to what they're talking about, to what's on the screen. So can there be like too much of that the other way? I think you're right. And I mean, I'm only speaking anecdotally at this point. I know mm -hmm. my presentations in my classes, I get feedback that uh, they really like it when I put the slide up, discuss it, take it away and just get back to just speaking without the slide. I don't know how uh, realistic that is in a conference setting where you've got that screen, something's got to be up there. So unless you put like a black, a black slide in there, something's going to be up there. I guess uh, to your point, it's critical that you don't have a slide up there that's no longer what you're discussing because then there's that cognitive dissonance the right. dissonance they're like why is greg talking about this is there some like deep connection between what he's saying now and what this slide is right because i know that's where my brain would go and and that's where mine goes too where i kind of get stuck and i'm like wait 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 how is this relating here and and then i lose interest in what they're talking about i'm spending too many cycles trying to connect the two and then and then i just Ah, I'm done with it. Let me check my mail. <laughs> <laughs> I check my email. Yeah. So, well, okay. You, you mentioned beforehand being a clown and I've never been a clown per se. I, I think that some high school teachers back in the day said, would say that I was a class clown, uh, which is fine, but we won't go into that here. But uh, how does being a clown 
relate to any sort of a technical type presentation? Well, that's that's such a great question because it, that's why I get so excited. Well, first of all, I need to acknowledge the elephant in the room. I, a, a clown has a bad connotation these days, and I'm I get it. I totally get it. Like super creepy, it like Pennywise. <laughs> totally understand creepy clown. Um, what? And and I I also was kind of freaked out by clowns or anything where I can't see the face or it's not clear what the emotion is. It's it's creepy. Um, I'm more talking about uh, clown presence, which means uh, utter uh, uh, authenticity when I'm presenting. Like I am being, I, I don't have subtext. I'm I'm being totally transparent when I'm on stage. That's what I mean by clown presence, but. The thing about that is when you are being transparent, when you're being authentic, everybody's not perfect. We are imperfect. So when I what clown has to do with public speaking is being confident enough to show my imperfections as a presenter. And I think this is doubly important for technical presentations, for cybersecurity presentations, because uh, as I have bobbles if if oh geez this is the wrong slide sorry everybody let me just change this perfect okay we're moving along i find that that actually helps me engage in a on a deeper level if i really know my content there was a study done it was called the and the it was in the 50s the uh a person who created the study came up with a theory called the pratfall effect and this i'll, I'll try and make this quick they had two groups of presenters. One group of presenters was super, super competent, knew their material up and down. Second group of presenters, not so confident. They didn't know their content. Uh, each group would spill their coffee, or e half of each group would spill their coffee. So in the super competent presenters, the uh, presenters that spilled their coffee were rated as really, really highly likable. They were super competent. They also spilled their coffee. Now, the people that did not practice their presentations were not competent and spilled their coffee. Audience just hated them, hated them. So the takeaway is, if you are really ready, if you know your content up and down, don't worry about it. Because imperfections in the presentation will actually engage you more to the audience because they'll just be like, Oh yeah, you had a presentation. You had a problem. Just get it out of the way. I want to hear what you have to say. You, you, you have information I need to have, and I trust you. That's perfect because I know there are times when I feel like that I'm nervous before before starting, and and sometimes I have in my head I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and people like me. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm, that's totally the, the affirmation. So I'll have to remember that as well too because you you, you do tend to want to over prep and be over perfect but if you can give yourself some grace then everything goes a lot smoothly but i guess it all comes back to the core you have to be competent in what you're speaking about so. yeah absolutely and just to wrap it back to clown a clown bit is like a circ or if you watch a clown they're the whole basic structure of a bit is they come out they have an intention to present something they're proud of to the audience it usually goes awry in some way. Uh, the clown sh feels that uh, kind of embarrassment or whatever, shares the authenticity with the audience, tries again, is optimistic, tries again, of course, fails again in a more fantastic way. The audience is even more engaged and it keeps happening. They keep failing, keep sharing, keep failing, keep sharing. And usually in a clown bit, they kind of bumble backwards into some kind of transcendent success. Uh, but the takeaway is every time they are imperfect, they actually engage the audience more. Wonderful. So if people want to get a hold of you, maybe engage you for a speaking uh, engagement. I said engagement twice there, but I didn't say ah. How can they get a hold of you? Uh, just go to winktechtalks.com. And that is the, it's a website for uh, training technical teams. And you can certainly reach out to me uh, there and, and I can help with any questions anybody has. And also uh, I have a free resource in case you're any of your 
uh, listeners have any technical presentations coming up, if they go to doncolliver.com forward slash engage, there's a free exercise on there that you can start drilling this ability to know your content and split that attention with observing and engaging with your audience and kind of holding both of those things in your hands at the same time. That sounds like a great resource. I'm definitely going to try that myself after this. Don, thank you so much for joining us today. It's a great, great conversation. I'm sure it's going to help out a lot of folks in the cyberspace. That's great. Thanks, Greg. And everybody stay secure. <laughs>